Hi there, this is Maria and I'm here with what I hope to be the first in a long series of short herb walks, medicinal and edible plant and mushroom walks. And a lot of these are going to be based in the Rocky Mountains uh, of Colorado, but also in some of the more deserty areas around the Four Corners area where I live and elsewhere in the country as I travel there. And so this first walk is set in the San Juan Mountains, so part of the Wimanooch Wilderness north of Durango. And for those who are local, this is near Mullis Pass. And so this is the Lake Andrews area, uh, Crater Lake Trail, that goes between those two lakes. And the plants you're going to see are those you can expect to be blooming in the summer, especially in July, when these photos were taken. And for anybody who has questions or needs to contact me, my contact info is found at the bottom of this slide. And so that's me. Again, my name is Maria. I am an herbal practitioner and an herbal teacher and writer, as well as a research scientist living in Durango, Colorado. Although this photo is actually Utah, not Colorado. So let's get into it. This is a really wonderful, beautiful, and good smelling medicinal plant, Arnica. And so this plant is in kind of the initial grassy area that you encounter as you start on the trail. And so well, we're about 10,600 feet or so up in the mountains. Uh, and so Arnica cordifolia is the botanical name. Cordifolia means heart-shaped leaves. And as you look at the photo, you can see that the leaves are indeed heart-shaped, though there are other Arnica species locally with different shaped leaves. And when I first moved here, uh, I encountered this plant and it wasn't blooming and I thought, wow, what is this plant? It smells so good. Is it a mint? But it had some qualities that weren't really consistent with being a mint. Uh, and it was only once it bloomed that I thought, oh, you dummy, it's, it's Arnica. And so this is a, a, quite a common plant in this part of the country. But its growth range is really limited to some of the mountain areas of the West. And as a result, uh, there's an organization called United Plant Savers that you can look up online who has some, a little bit of concern about the sustainability of using this plant as medicine. Uh, other herbalists, such as the late great Michael Moore, not to be confused with the filmmaker Michael Moore, uh, feel like this is really plentiful and it's not a problem harvesting it. But in Europe, it's actually a protected plant because it was so over-harvested there as to become a problem. Uh, but I like to talk about sustainability issues for certain plants. I just feel like it can help people decide what they do and don't want to use as medicine. And so Arnica can be good medicine. You do need to be careful with it. There is the potential for significant toxicity, but I'll come back to that in just a moment. Many of you are probably familiar with this plant. Uh, a lot of grocery stores now and even drug stores carry Arnica homeopathic pills for use uh, in terms of muscle injury and joint injury, connective tissue injuries. There are a lot of creams and ointments and other topical preparations you can buy commercially for those same types of injuries. And while a lot of people automatically reach for Arnica the minute they get injured, I actually, uh, and other herbalists, uh, actually feel like it may work better a little bit later on in the process when there's still some pain with movement, uh, as Michael Moore described, but some of that initial swelling has gone down. And the reason is, is because this is a warming plant. It's actually gonna stimulate blood flow to the site uh, on which you're applying it. And you don't really wanna do that when your knee is the size of a grapefruit <laughs> after twisting it. Uh, you, you know, it might be good to wait a few days. Uh, what I do like to use immediately is goldenrod, but that will be on a, another herb walk at some future point. Uh, and so you can use the flowers. Uh, the roots are actually the strongest, but if you use the flowers, they are plenty strong and they prevent you from killing the plant. You're not uprooting the plant to collect it. Uh, Michael Moore also mentioned that the leaves are useful as well. And if you, if you take a little piece of the leaf and smell it, indeed, you can smell the resin, which is part of the medicine in the leaf. And I actually like the idea of using the leaves because they're maybe not quite as strong. So slightly reduced chance for toxicity if you use it wrong. Now, you don't want to use Arnica topically on open skin, and you really want to know what you're doing if you are harvesting and making your own medicine out of this plant. So for instance, I make an infused olive oil with parts of the plant to use for injuries topically, uh, but I actually further dilute that medicinal oil in plain olive oil, um, say one part to four before I put it on my skin, and I never use it on open skin. 
there is the potential for contact dermatitis due to one of the chemicals called a sesquiterpene lactone, part of the essential oil of the plant. Uh, and so just be aware of that. If you tend to react to a lot of things on your skin, you get rashes just looking at things, maybe you don't want to touch Arnica. Now, uh, Arnica used internally has caused very significant negative effects. In fact, people have died from overdosing on Arnica extracts. This is not a plant to really use internally beyond the commercial homeopathics that you can find uh, in an herb shop or a drugstore or a natural food store or grocery store what have you, um, unless you really, really, really know what you're doing. And so people have gone into respiratory failure from taking Arnold, uh, Arnica internally. Other people have gone through uh, multi-organ system failure, trying to use Arnica as an abortifacient or basically trying to use it to terminate a pregnancy. It can induce severe digestive system issues, damaging those mucous membrane linings along the digestive tract, causing really bad cramping and vomiting and diarrhea. It can have an effect on our muscles. It can cause tremors and dizziness, so it's having an effect on the nervous system. And heartbeat irregularities. And I'm not saying all of this stuff to scare the hell out of you so that you don't want to use Arnica. Just be careful. You know, maybe if you're not uh, confident in your medicine making abilities or your level of knowledge at this point, then just buy the commercial preps and they're fine. Just don't use them on broken skin. Um, so it is a really useful plant, but uh, one of those plants that does need to be respected. Now, in terms of a plant that's really ridiculously safe and beautiful, here's wild strawberry. So we're walking along some grassy areas, um, some interspersed fir trees, uh, still at about 10 6 or so in elevation. And so wild strawberry though grows all over the place. It's not restricted to the mountain west the way that Arnica is. It can be found in many parts of uh, the temperate world. And so this particular species is Fragaria, F-R-A-G-A-R-I-A, -A uh, Virginiana. And there's another species of wild strawberry around here as well. And the berries are tiny but powerful. They're like distilled down in terms of strawberry flavor. They're absolutely delicious. As with domesticated strawberries, you know, your typical garden strawberries, they're very high in vitamin C. And the red pigmentation of the berries, which you're not actually seeing in this photo, uh, those pigments are really great antioxidants and anti-inflammatory for use in the body. And Basically, oxidative stress or a high free radical load and chronic inflammation are some of the driving factors among many um, that are involved in a lot of the chronic diseases that folks in the West are dealing with nowadays. And so who couldn't use a little less inflammation in the body? The leaves are also good medicine, and so you can make a nutritious tea out of them. They're great for what I would call leakiness. So they, they have a quality about them that is called astringency. And to understand what astringency means, uh, maybe take a bite out of a banana that's not ripe yet, and you'll feel that kind of drying sensation on your tongue. Uh, that's astringency. Or take just a quick bite of the peel and spit it out. That'll give you a sense of astringency. And so astringency kind of tones the tissues that the astringent chemicals come into contact with and, and makes them a little tighter. Uh, you know, improves their integrity so that they can hold fluids in better. And so what do you use the leaves for? Loose stools. And so be warned, I'm an herbalist and a microbiologist, and I talk about poop a lot. You can stop listening now if that's a problem for you, but otherwise you can continue on. And so loose stools. Now, you know, strawberry leaves may or may not be so useful for really explosive dysentery type diarrhea. Uh, I mean, they won't hurt, but they're probably not going to be strong enough. But sort of the chronic, loose, pasty stools that people with weak digestive function or people that are eating things that their body is not particularly fond of tend to have. And then in another area of leakiness, excessive menstrual bleeding or even other types of bleeding. These, these can act as a styptic um, topically or... Um, can act internally to slow that bleeding down. And so people that have really heavy periods, women who are going through perimenopause, who maybe are subjected to some flooding, strawberry leaf can help normalize that. And for those of you who have heard of raspberry leaf as a uterine tonic in preparation for pregnancy, you can use strawberry leaf much in the same way. Um, the leaves are also great topically for stings. And so you could literally just chew them up and make a spit poultice and stick it on that bug bite. 
You can use it for rashes or itching. You can also make a tea out of the leaves and use them as a wash for any of those issues or make a compress, which is basically where you're soaking a cloth in a leaf tea and then putting that over the area. So it's great for a little bit of skin first aid, which is handy if you're out hiking and you get stung by something or you bump into a plant that makes you itch. If you know how to identify strawberry, you've got instant first aid right there on hand for you. Uh, and you'll notice uh, the flower, uh, five petals, that is characteristic of members of the rose family. And so strawberry is indeed a member of that family. Moving on, we have a really strikingly beautiful yellow plant here. This is mountain parsley. And the botanical name, I'm going to spell it for you, C-Y-M-O-P-T-R-U-S is the first part of the name, and Lemonii, L-E-M-M-O-N-I-I, -I, is the second part of the botanical name. Again, botanical names are important to make sure you know the plant that you're reading about, you know what people are absolutely talking about, because sometimes plants have uh, share a common name. There are other plants called parsley that are not the same plant as this. Now, uh, the second part of the name is actually named for Mount Lemon in Tucson, which I saw uh, for the first and only time, actually, this year. It's absolutely a beautiful mountain uh, that takes you from sort of deserty climate at the bottom to more of an alpine cold climate at the top. Really uh, gorgeous place for any people that are into the natural world or into e ecology. Um, etc. But anyway, uh, the fellow that named this was a botanist. He and his wife were on their honeymoon in Tucson and stumbled upon this plant and named it uh, what they named it after Mount Lemon. Now, of course, people have long known about this plant before um, it was named and it was known as under other names as well. But this is the name that seems to have stuck in terms of herb books and botanists and the like. So the leaves have a parsley-ish type flavor, and indeed they're in the same family, the APACE family. Uh, and that family also has carrot in it, and uh, you know parsley that you would grow in your garden. A lot of great medicinal plants like Osha and Angelica are in this family. And two of the deadliest plants in North America, poison hemlock and wild hemlock, are also in this family. And so the point being is you really need to know what the hell you're doing if you're out harvesting uh, APACA family members. You need to know um, absolutely the idea of the plant you're picking to avoid a potentially fatal mistake. And so the leaves here you can use similarly to regular old garden parsley. And the root uh, you can use as well. It has sort of a parsnip-like flavor. So if you don't like parsnips, don't bother with the root. If you like parsnips, you can use the root of mountain parsley in similar ways. Now there's a look-alike plant called Lomatium. That's a great and strong antiviral plant, but is also a plant that may cause contact dermatitis in some people. And they can grow in similar in uh, alpine kind of montane areas. Uh, Lomatium is going to be a much bigger plant. It's going to be taller, a little sturdier, thicker stalked. And Mountain parsley is going to be a little bit smaller. And so, you know, go on some plant walks uh, in person when you have a chance. Get a few ID books, etc., to help you distinguish amongst the various APACA family members. Now, uh, in terms of confusing different plants, in this next slide, you'll see three photos on the left that belong to a non-toxic plant, and two photos on the right that actually belong to quite a toxic plant. On the left, we have wild geranium, and on the right we have larkspur or delphinium that I'll talk about momentarily. But wild geranium, non-toxic, but the leaves look similar. So you can see where if you're not paying attention, it can be easy to make a mistake and pick the wrong plant. Wild geranium, non-toxic. So this is geranium richardsonii. Sometimes plants are named after, you know, the botanist that... You know, I hate to say discovered because <laughs> there are indigenous people who knew about these plants long before whatever bot obnoxious botanist <laughs> showed up and named uh, the plant. And so uh, botanical names can also be really fun. You can learn a lot about the plant uh, by looking up what the scientific name means. But in this case, it's kind of boring. It's just named after some guy. Uh, Anyway, uh, the root and the leaves are astringent. I've talked about astringency. They can help with leakiness. Uh, the root in particular is going to be stronger. It's going to be stronger than strawberry leaves as well. So that would be a little bit more reasonable for using uh, with more uh, acute diarrhea type issues, geranium root. Uh, although it can also help with chronic loose stools as well. 
and bleeding like I talked about for strawberry leaf you can use geranium root for a lot of the same things menstrual flooding and the like um, it can stop bleeding um, and this can also be useful for inflammatory issues um, all through the digestive tract say things like mouth ulcers or you bit your cheek and it's really irritating the heck out of you um, all the way through the digestive tract to the end our butt where there may be hemorrhoids for some unfortunate people. And so you can use the root uh, for that as well in various ways. Uh, also good for inflammation elsewhere on mucous membranes. And so this is useful for vaginitis, which is inflammation of the vaginal lining. And so a way to do that would be something like um, a root tea where you do it as a douche, although I'm not a big fan of douching. I don't like to strip the mucous membrane and change the pH of that area, but sometimes it can be helpful. Another way to go would be to make a tea, a nice clean tea, and use an herbal tampon for vaginitis, or maybe make a salve. I've not tried this, but make a root salve that you can apply, and that might be a really good way to go. Uh, so geranium. Unfortunately, you're not seeing the flowers. It was a little too early in July when I took these photos. Uh, the flowers uh, are really pretty. The color depends on the species. In this case, they're going to be pinkish, um, a little bit more on the pale side, and maybe even a little bit of white on them. With some of the other species, they're going to be darker pink, even approaching sort of a magenta color. And so it makes the point that it's really good to know how to ID your plants even when they're not blooming, you know. And I mentioned in the beginning of this talk that I didn't know Arnica was the first time I saw it because it wasn't blooming. It smelled really distinctive, but uh, it kind of misled me a little bit to think it was something else. And so the point I'm making here with the geranium and the delphinium speaks to the same. So uh, good to know your plants even when they're not blooming. So go out to the same place where you live for an herb walk at different times of the year to get to know your plant friends in different stages of development. All right, next on the list is lady slipper, how I learned it, or fairy slipper, some other herbalists call it. it this is a beautiful orchid, uh, and its botanical name is Calypso bulbosa. And Calypso uh, is from Greek, and it means concealment. And so these flowers are not going to be found in the wide open uh, waste areas where a new shopping center may be being built. These flowers are not going to be found along the highway. Uh, but you will find them in very healthy montane and alpine environments, very clean environments. And you will see them along trail sides in those environments, as long as the area is otherwise relatively undisturbed. Now, it's concerning because the range of this flower over the past few decades seems to be shrinking. And so uh, moving north, basically, uh, which perhaps may be reflective of climate change going on. And so I actually don't pick this. It is medicinal, but there's not enough of it. And there's so many other plants that are more common that are medicinal. I don't use this, but I love seeing it. Um, sometimes I'll go a season without seeing it at all, and sometimes I'll see maybe a dozen of them if I'm really lucky along a trail. And so it's a really great plant to kind of sit and do what I like to call spirit medicine with. So just kind of hang out with it, <laughs> chat with it, look at it, appreciate it send it your good wishes, maybe take a picture and move on. Now, this one is not a plant. <laughs> this is a mushroom. Uh, probably one of the best recognized mushrooms around the world. This is uh, Amanita muscaria or fly agaric. Stunningly beautiful mushroom. And so you see the red cap there and those white spots are what's left of a membrane that surrounded the entire mushroom right when it was first growing. And so on the right you'll see some little baby Amanitas growing and then on the left are some uh, mature Amanitas. And a lot of people are actually afraid of this mushroom and they think it's deadly poisonous, but the reality is, is there aren't, there are very few, if any, credible reports of deaths being caused by this mushroom in North America. That said, it is toxic. It contains uh, two main nervous system toxics, toxins, uh, ebotenic acid and muscimol, uh, probably butchering the pronunciation on these. If it's not immediately obvious, my pronunciation is not always that fantastic. Uh, and they, they are toxic to your nervous system and can make you sick for quite a while. You can also have, aside from some unpleasant nervous system experiences, some unpleasant gastrointestinal issues as well. But this is not the same as other of the Amanitas, like the death cap 
uh, Amanita virosa or the destroying angel Amanita phylloides that basically destroy your liver. Uh, different genus, or not different genus, but different species in the same genus with different sorts of toxicity. And so uh, one of the best known uses of Amanita was for shamanic journeying, journeying spiritual, um, spiritual uses. And so that uh, was very common on the Kamchatka Peninsula, so far eastern Russia, Siberia, that part of the world. And... Um, but also used similarly in many other parts of the world where it grows. And there's a lot of really cool folklore around this mushroom. Santa Claus is thought to derive in part, um, uh, well, I should say should, was inspired in part by this mushroom. So that red and white outfit that he wears and the flying reindeers are thought to be symbolic of Fly Agaric with the red and white mushroom. And so the reindeer link is because in Siberia, where reindeer are often found, they eat the mushroom. They actively seek it out, and their behavior suggests that they actually are pretty much high after eating the mushroom. And uh, one of the, the neat little factoids about fly agaric is if you use the mushroom for entheogenic practices, your urine will still have a significant amount of muscimol in it. So it was traditional to drink the urine of somebody who ingested this mushroom, and you could repeat that process about five times. Uh, maybe not so appealing for, for all of us. Uh, but reindeer would also seek out the human urine of people that were using this mushroom for journeying. And indeed, its name, fly agar, the word fly, on one hand may reflect that journeying from taking the mushroom as an entheogen, but it also reflects the fact that the mushroom lures flies and gets them drunk, and you can uh, use it basically to kill flies in your home. And so in Lithuania, where my mother's family is from, they call it the fly-dyed mushroom, and they would steep it in milk, and the flies would be attracted to the mushroom. They would land in the milk, they would get drunk, basically stupefied, I love that word, by the mushroom and then drown in the milk. And so it was a great way to get rid of flies. And everywhere where this mushroom grows, that was one of the uses. And fly appears in some way, shape or form in the name of the mushroom. And so there is a way to eat this safely where you are removing the ebotenic acid in the muscimol. Um, and if you want to learn how to do that, you can either look at uh, one of the papers that discusses this by Aurora, A O, oh, sorry, A R O R A, and Rubel, R U B E L. Uh, they talk about the edibility of this mushroom. Uh, or you can get a book by, uh, let's see, Roger Roberts, is it? I always get his name mixed up, Robert Rogers. Uh, and it, it's called The Fungal Pharmacy, and he talks about medicinal uses of mushrooms in North America. And he also talks about how to prepare this mushroom safely if you want to eat it without getting sick. And I have to say, I do it, and it's absolutely delicious. But, you know, not something to embark on unless you have good reference material for what you're doing so that you don't wind up making yourself sick. I also use various preparations of this mushroom topically as a pain reliever. And again, just something that you might want to really know what you're doing before you start embarking on. And the fungal pharmacy book that I mentioned can be a great way to, to explore a little more. And if you want to geek out any more on this mushroom, I have an article that just came out today um, called Amanita muscaria, the flying mushroom, and it's in Plant Healer magazine, which if you're not already subscribed to, I highly, highly, highly recommend subscribing to. It's a quarterly that's usually about 300 some pages, four times a year of great plants and botanical mushroom and other information. All right, moving on. We just have a, a handful of plants left. Uh, so back to delphinium or larkspur, the one with the leaves that can confuse you and make you think maybe it's geranium, at least until you see it bloom. And then when you see it bloom, it's very obviously not geranium. So this is why you need to learn to ID plants when they're not blooming, because larkspur or delphinium that you're looking at here is toxic. Geranium is not toxic. And so this is a garden plant. Other species of this plant, I should say, are common garden plants. Um, this is the larkspur that's really common around here. Delphinium is the botanical name, and the specific species is B-A-R-B-E-Y-I. And I'm going to go on a limb and try to pronounce it Barbei, <laughs> which means beard, which refers to some of the structures on the plant. Delphinium in Latin actually means dolphin, which also refers to the shape of the flower. And so this plant used to be used 
medicinally, but not so much anymore. It is poisonous uh, and contains a number of chemicals known as alkaloids, um, at least one of which is known to, to suppress breathing and have cardiac effects and cause weak muscles. And in fact, uh, in the West, uh, there's a lot of open range land and cattle will eat this plant and it can kill them or at least make them really, really sick. So another plant to just look at and appreciate. Stunningly beautiful plant. I like just hanging out with it. I don't kick it over. I don't pick it to stick in a vase on my kitchen table because some of these plants are decades old. They send up a new stalk and flowers year after year after year, and I like to respect that um, by just looking at them, but otherwise uh, leaving them alone. When a plant's potentially older than me, <laughs> I, just, I feel like I don't really have a right to pick it. Now, I, here is a plant that I do harvest. This is elder, one of my favorite medicinal plants and one of the more well-known medicinal plants around the temperate world. This is Sambucus racemosa. So uh, the berries that this bush is eventually gonna make are gonna be red. And there's a little bit of toxicity with the red berries that you don't see in maybe some of the more familiar blue and purple berried elders. Uh, but the, the flowers of Sambucus racemosa are totally fine to harvest. And so I make a pilgrimage up to the higher areas around Durango every June uh, and July to harvest some elder flowers. And then uh, I get my dark berried species uh, later on in the summer. I get the berries later on um, from other species of elder. So there's Sambucus nigra and other elder species with, where the dark berries are not toxic. And so elder is a great, whether we're talking about the flowers or also the berries as well, a great cold and flu herb. And research has actually shown that some of the chemicals in elder actually inhibit the binding of influenza virus to the receptor on the cell that lets the virus into the cell. So viruses need to get into our cells in order to grow and to replicate themselves and make progeny. And so if they can't get into the cells, then they can't reproduce. And that infection is essentially dead in the water. And so elder is one of the plants I reach for um, during cold and flu season. I use uh, the, the flowers as a tincture. I use the flowers as a tea. I like to use the berries as a syrup. Has a lot of other medicinal properties as well, antibacterial activity. Um, and the berries, because of their dark pigments, so when we're talking other species of elders with those blue or black berries, those pigments are great for toning our vasculature. So people that have capillary fragility, people who bruise really easily, people who have a tendency towards varicose veins would do well to use elderberries, dark colored berries in general in various forms. And so elderberry syrup is a very easy recipe to find online and a very delicious one um, that you can use um, um, with different species of elder. And so there is thought to be a spirit of this plant. All plants are thought to have spirits. And so there's the elder mother that is associated with this plant. And this comes out of a lot of European folklore. And people in Europe would not harvest wood from this plant. Um, or at least they wouldn't harvest the wood without asking permission of the elder mother because it was thought that if you just went and started chopping branches off of it, believe it or not, it's actually a tree in other parts of the world, not a little shrub like what you see here. Um, but if you take the wood, it's going to bring you bad luck. And so, for instance, if you make a cradle for your baby out of elder wood, that baby may die or have colic and such. And so people tend to leave the wood alone uh, due to that reason. And there's another great bit of folklore around this plant. There's actually a whole wealth of folklore around this plant. But another story that I like is that if you sit under an elder on Midsummer's Eve, so that's not actually the same day as the solstice, just be aware. Uh, but if you sit under an elder on Midsummer's Eve, you're supposed to be able to see the elder mother, mother and her retinue of fairies go by. And so I actually did this one year. Um, here in Durango, I, I crouched under my little elder shrub that I was growing at midnight, and I did not, unfortunately, see the elder queen and her fairies, but I did see the International Space Station go overhead, so that was pretty cool. Um, it was at a time when there were two U.S. astronauts and a Russian cosmonaut on the space station, and so all was not <laughs> for naught, sitting out at midnight past my bedtime. Um, 
moving on, I could do an entire plant walk just standing around Elder and talking, but I want to talk about one more plant in this first installment of our Crater Lake Trail Herb Walk, and that is Mountain Death Camas. So I do have a thing for toxic plants, I'm not going to lie. This is a really beautiful, beautiful white flowered plant that is pretty common around here in the San Juan Mountains and in other parts of the West. And I do not use it as medicine. It contains some to uh, toxic alkaloid chemicals in it. There are other death camas species that are even more toxic, but this one is toxic enough that you really should respect it. And it's known that if people eat it, there have been occasional deaths associated with that ingestion. Uh, it can cause serious illness where you might want to be dead. Um, and livestock poisoning out here in the, you know, the open ranges of the West is also a pretty serious problem. Um, now, there is a plant that is blue camas, and it also goes by other names, uh, that is related, and it has striking blue flowers instead of white flowers. And in that case, the plant is great food. The root is edible from that plant, or I should say the tuber underground, um, the, the starch storage uh, unit of the plant is edible, but that is a different species. It's a blue flowered species And so people have made the mistake of eating uh, the wrong plant not a great mistake to make so know your plants very well a hundred percent Identity before sticking them in your mouth and with that I am going to stop blabbing and wrap it up this is a shot of the area where this herb walk is that's Mount Snowden or Snowden Peak in the background really sharp-edged big mountain <laughs> that is in our beautiful Wimanooch wilderness here. And you can see the plethora of wildflowers uh, along the trail. Uh, really beautiful trail. If you live here to go walk on, and if you don't live here and you ever visit Durango, look me up and I'll tell you how to get there to just uh, check out what's grown. And with that, good health, green blessings, and I will see you in the next installment of this herb walk.